Open your Bibles to the book of Romans. I'll try not to say Revelation for at least a couple of months. I'm so used to going there. But let's turn to the epistle of Romans. And needless to say, we'll be here for quite a while. Not today, but over the months. <laughs> Some of you are panicked about lunch. And we need to get a yodeler. <laughs> Clay, can you yodel? We'll use you. All right. Can you yodel scripture? That would be kind of difficult. Well, we begin our study of the book of Romans. One of the most theologically rich and yet practical books in the Bible. Someone asked me if you were going to take one book of the Bible to a deserted island, which would it be? It'd probably be Romans for me because it's packed with Old Testament and New Testament uh, about the, who we are in the body of Christ, this unique dispensation, and then how to apply all that. The problem with the Old Testament quotes is you've got to know the Old Testament and know what he's saying. Um, so I've been asked to teach this book many times over the years, uh, never did the book verse by verse, but I've gone to it many, many times in parallel to other passages that we've covered over these 18 years, and so now we come to the actual verse by verse study of the epistle. So let's, um, let's pray before we begin. Gracious Heavenly Father, we again thank you for getting us through the book of Revelation and the enjoyment it was to see um, what's coming in the future through Bible prophecy. And now we thank you that we get to study this incredible epistle written by your servant, Paul. And may we be all edified from it. If we're not, either I'm teaching it wrong or we're not listening, because this is an incredible book and a, a central book for our spiritual growth. So guide us by the Holy Spirit that indwells us, and may we be edified and come to love you more deeply and serve you better. In Jesus we pray, amen. Well, I want to introduce the book today, and I want to start by reading an introductory comment about Romans from the New King James Version introductory notes. Um, a good comment. He says, Romans serves as the flagship of the fleet of Pauline letters within the New Testament. This letter also loomed large in the history of Christianity. Countless men and women of faith have singled out Romans as the weapon God graciously used to bring about their surrender to Christ. Augustine, Martin Luther, John Wesley, and others received unexpected spiritual volleys from Romans that pierced their defenses and ended their rebellion against God. Because, boy, aren't we as unbelievers... Our guard is up, and arrows don't penetrate, right? But God's Word can do so. He goes on to say, Romans combines breadth, logic, and a mature understanding of the Old Testament Scriptures into a powerful arsenal. By the time it was written, the Holy Spirit had shaped the Apostle Paul into a skillful communicator of the faith. The result is his letter to the Romans, a theological treatise that perfectly fits Paul's description of all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16. The letter represents a full expression of apostolic theology. Paul's arguments challenge the secular pagan mind, yet they also pierce the shallow spiritual confidence of many non-pagans. Many times I've gone into the jail system, and even outside of it, and get attacks on imputed righteousness and eternal security. And you know what book I go to a lot? Romans. And sometimes it, it pierces their false views, I think, and, and, and really convicts them of the truth. Romans is a mighty leveler. I love this. It's a mighty leveler, for it declares that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. I always said by the time you got to Chapter 3, Romans has cut everybody off at the knees. Nobody has a chance outside of Christ to be saved. And we'll see that clearly in the book. 
Since all are sinners, it comes as a delightful shock that God demonstrates His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. This is the good news, which Paul so eloquently and systematically defends in this theological treatise addressed to the Romans. So with that introduction, let's just go over a few things. Let's talk about various things about the epistle. First of all, who is the author? The Apostle Paul is actually called the author of this epistle. Romans 1.1, the first verse, what is the, what's the first word in the text? Paul. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Paul was a very interesting man. Um, all of his background and how God used, used this man so mightily. A Jew that would become the apostle to the Gentiles. So he was a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. Remember, uh, Israel had 12 tribes. Benjamin was one of them. So Romans 11.1, 1, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? Speaking of the Jews. May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant or the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So even in this book, he describes himself as a Jewish man. Philippians 3, 5, he says, I was circumcised the eighth day because under the law of Moses in Leviticus 12, it was required to circumcise the male child on day eight. Of the nation Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Um, some have said that this describes a Hebrew-speaking Jew. Uh, as to the law, a Pharisee. So Paul was a religious leader, and we know about them Pharisees, right? And how Jesus had to really deal with many of them who were against him. And Paul was the same, right? For a while, he was killing Christians, and then in Acts 9, he meets Jesus on the Damascus Road, and his life changed. And now, all the suffering Paul inflicted on God's people, he, Jesus said, now I'm going to show you what kind of suffering you're going to go through, because you're going to be afflicted uh, by uh, now as a Christian, you'll be afflicted by those who hate me as well. And now Paul is going to be one of the best servants God ever produced. Now, some think the idea of Pauline authorship contradicts Romans 16.22. Uh, uh, jump over there. Go to the last chapter, 22nd verse. So if Paul wrote it, why do you have this? Romans 16, 22. I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. Was that Paul's surname or another a nickname? No, this is what they call an, amanu an amanuensis. So it's very common in the ancient world to have somebody, you would dictate the letter to them, they would write it down. And that's who this man is. Dr. Robert Dean said the following about this verse. He says, Tertius was Paul's amanuensis, a word for a scribe or secretary. It was typical in the ancient world that someone would write a letter and dictate it to a scribe. So Tertius is one who wrote this down. And some ask how this affects the doctrine of inspiration. You know, all scriptures God breathed. The inspiration is coming through the apostle Paul, and he's the one who at the end signs off on it. Now, I know Robbie Dean personally, he would argue that the Holy Spirit is the one that guided the writers, no doubt, and as he's guiding Paul, Paul tells the amanuensis what to write down, see? Uh, so he would dictate it to Tertius and then go over it, making any corrections, and then the final copy would be completed by Tertius before it was sent out. In many cases, multiple copies like this would be made because in some cases, it would be sent not just to one church, but to multiple churches. They just didn't have that printing press, right, to make copies. So that's why in textual criticism, you'll have variants in the manuscripts. Um, there's different manuscripts that were copied, and then you, if you have a variant reading, you just compare those. And Anyone ever take a course in textual criticism? Reuben, you do one? Did you run out of the room screaming like I did? I mean, it's very complicated, and 
It's not my forte, but there are some, Ravi Dean's very good at textual criticism, and then he says Dan Wallace makes him look like an amateur. So Dan Wallace of Dallas Seminary is probably, in our camp, one of the best textual critics alive and well known for that. So don't get all wrapped up on that, that the Bible can't be trusted and, and all that. There's, there's ways to argue that. So who is his audience? Well, they're believers who are located in Rome. Romans 1, 7, to all, notice he's writing to all who are beloved of God in Rome, uh, called saints. The word as is not in the Greek. We'll t study that later. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So being called beloved of God and also called saints are really holy ones, called holy ones, indicate that they were children of God, no doubt. Paul will do this to the Colossians. He says to the believers at Colossae, as those who have been chosen of God, so all believers are elect in Christ, holy and beloved, so that's our position, that's who we are, we're chosen, holy and beloved, therefore put on, this is the walk, notice position and then do something based on your position. Know who you are and then be who you are. You can't be who you are if you don't know who you are. So put on a heart of compassion, it's a command. Put on a heart of kindness and humility, gentleness, and patience. Dr. John Whitmer said, Paul addressed it to all who are in Rome who are loved by God and called saints, verse 7, and did not address it to the church in Rome. That a church did exist in Rome is obvious because Paul sent greetings to the church that met in the home of Priscilla and Aquila in 16.5. There were probably many churches in Rome, and that's why Paul addressed it to the saints and not to the church. Um, now, within this audience, there was a mixed audience of Jews and Gentiles in Rome. How about Jews? How do we know? Well, we know Aquila was a Jew, Romans 16.3, compared to Acts 18.2. Uh, so when you study these epistles, the, the narrative in Acts will be very helpful. Uh, when Paul goes to uh, Corinth, I believe that's Acts 18. Am I right there, Clay? Okay, just checking to make sure you're on the ball. But you want to go get the historical narrative of when Paul went to Corinth, you can read that chapter. And Clay's doing a great job going through uh, uh, overview of Acts and the Paul's missionary journeys and things like that. So that actually is, is a helpful foundation to what we're studying. Uh, Andronicus, Junius, and Herodian were Jewish. All three identified as Paul's relatives. Romans 16, 7, and also verse 11. Paul actually addressed the Jews, you being a Jew, uh, 2, 17. And Paul called Abraham his forefather, 4, 1, and 4, 12. But are there Gentiles addressed in the book? Of course. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles and spoke to them directly. Um, I have Romans eleven thirteen 13 up there. Paul says, I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, non-Jewish people, Inasmuch then as I am uh, an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. So remember the Abrahamic covenant promised blessing through Abraham's seed. Jesus is the ultimate seed of Abraham, the Messiah, who is from the tribe of, of Judah. So he's Jewish. And uh, Abraham's seed would include the nation Israel. So from the nation Israel came the ultimate seed, Jesus, who would even bless the Gentile nations. And so Paul has given been given this ministry to reach the Gentiles, which a lot of Jews didn't like, but they obviously didn't understand their Old Testament because that was part of it. So Paul's willing to do it as a Jew, but remember Jonah, he didn't want to go to Nineveh, a Gentile city, because they were mean, and they were a wicked people. But God sent him there because that's the Abrahamic covenant, and Jonah didn't want to go. But he, do, he does go with a little encouragement of being blown off that boat. And, and the great fish, not a whale, it's a dog gadol, which is a great fish, uh, spit him out on the beach and he goes in and ministers and there's a great revival. And then in chapter 4, he pouts. If you read the last section of chapter 4, God said, isn't this what I'm supposed to do by sending you? Isn't this my plan? Basically what he says. And he puts it in a question form. And so the book ends with a question and the answer is, of course you're to bless the Gentiles because that's the covenant you made with Abraham. Uh-oh, I'm, I'm already getting into Jonah. I'm going to have to do that one later. So the place and date of writing, 
On the location of writing, Dr. Dean said this. He said, the author states that he is familiar with Priscilla and Aquila. Paul was familiar with them according to Romans 16, 3 compared to Acts 18, 2 and 3. The author mentions in Romans 15, 25 and 27 that he is in the process of taking up a collection of money to take back to Jerusalem for the support of the poor among the believers. We know that this was something that the Apostle Paul was involved in on his third missionary journey, Acts 19, 21 and 21 through 5, 21, 15, 17 through 19, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 5, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 12 and 9, 1 through 5. So this fits with what we know of what the Apostle Paul was doing on his third missionary journey. So we believe he wrote the epistle to the Romans from Corinth. This would indicate that this fits with the scenario, with that scenario and plan. Now, when you get into the dating of books and Paul's missionary journeys and things that happen, that can get uh, complex. So the epistle was written probably in 56 to 57 A.D., probably early winter, January, February of that year. The only time that fits Paul's description in chapter 15 is his winter stay in Corinth at the end of his third missionary journey. Now we're already going to get into a little application here, which we're going to work on this for somebody, Mark, when we started this. And until I get to the end of the book, we're going to be doing this. So I think this is a pretty good outline of the book to follow, um, all the S's. I, I mean, acrostics and all that, they say it's helpful for memory, but a lot of people don't remember the acrostic. And, or you give illustrations to buttress a point, a lot of people can't even remember your illustration that you gave. So I'm a big fan of let's stick to the text, but this one's helpful. Um, this particular outline, I saw it in seminary as a matter of fact, and I added something at the beginning and the end, the salutation and summation, <clears throat> which are clearly there. So you have a salutation, the first 17 verses of chapter 1. Then he'll deal with the subject of sin, how all men are under sin, 118 through 320. And then salvation, 321 through 521. And I mean salvation from the penalty of sin. This is what, <clears throat> how an unbeliever got saved from the penalty of sin. And Paul will mention the word justification, which means to be declared righteous, as Jose prayed this morning. Uh, we thank you for the righteous standing we have before you. That be, that's because when we believe the gospel, God imputed instantaneously, credited perfect righteousness to our account. And once justified, that's just who we are. You can never change that. So we call that phase one, getting saved or justified. And then phase two is sanctification which can be positional, but a lot of times it deals with the Christian walk. So uh, chapter 6 through 8 will deal extensively with phase 2, the spiritual walk of the Christian. Um, sovereignty, uh, chapters 9 through 11, which is God's sovereign plan for Israel. And then the service of the Christian is 12, 1 through 15, 13. The mandates of the Christian life, they just come one at a time in that section. And then the summation, 15, 14 through 16, 27, Paul summarizes and then gives final greetings. So um, Paul is known for dividing his letters. He'll have a long section dealing with doctrine, positional truth, who, who we are in Christ, and then there'll be a section following with applicational truth. Probably the book that does it the best that's right split down the middle is Ephesians. Six chapters... The first three chapters are all doctrine and theology. The only mandate you'll even see is in 2.11 when he says, remember the former days. But all the mandates show up when? Oh, well, first of all, he tells you you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. You're chosen. You're redeemed through the blood. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit permanently. In chapter 2, you're saved. You're made alive, raised, and seated with him and then he says we're all part of the church, which is this unique administration that's never been before in history where Jew and Gentile are now united in one body called the church. It's called the mystery uh, in chapter 3. And then in chapter 4, based on all of that, therefore walk worthy of the calling by which you've been called. And then mandate after mandate after mandate all the way through chapter 6, which, clo which closes with put on the full armor of God and pray by means of the Spirit continually. 
at the end of the book. So Paul does this here um, in Romans. All this doctrinal information will occur in the first part of the book. Does anyone know the first mandate in Romans? No one's been able, able to challenge this yet. Maybe nobody ever tries. Um, where's the first mandate in the book? The first command. Romans 6.11. So if you want mandates on how to live the spiritual life, you got to wait till chapter 6, verse 11? Well, you do. Consider yourselves alive, de dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Consider is a command. So what does that tell you about the letter? From 1.1 1, 1 all the way to 6.10, we got to learn truth, just the basics, the doctrine, and then we can start applying that. So the principle is you can't properly apply God's Word without foundational truths in your soul. And all, a lot of times Christians just want to run to the applicational uh, section and they don't have any knowledge of the, the foundation by which to apply. And I think that's a mistake. Don't, uh, do it equally. Devote just as much attention to the doctrine as just as much attention as you would to the application. So how can you be who you are in Christ if you don't know who you are in Christ? James 1.22 says, be a hearer and a doer of the word. So how can you be a doer of the word by applying the word if you don't know it, if you've never heard it and understood it? Remember, y'all know the great Shema and the Hebrews have in Deuteronomy 6, Shema Yisrael. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Hear, O Israel. Well, hear means obey, but how are they going to obey mandates if they don't know mandates? How are they going to obey God's truth if they don't even know it? If they don't even know who they are? I mean, think about it. You're, you're a young Jew that's born in the wilderness, and you're going into the land. Aren't these Jews going to ask questions like, why are we this special chosen people? And why are we going into the promised land to kill Canaanites and to kill everything that breathes in certain areas of Canaan? Where would you get that information if you're in the wilderness in Deuteronomy, living as a Jew back in that day? Well, you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I mean, Paul's going to write, I'm sorry, Moses is going to write all this down. But was Moses alive during the time of Genesis? But God gave him that revelation to show that this is why you're going into the land. At Genesis 15, when God makes the covenant with Abraham and splits the animal pieces in two, and God walks alone through the animal pieces, he makes a unilateral covenant with Abraham. What does he then immediately tell him? Well, you're going to inherit a land. And when the time of the Amorite has been made full, after 400 years in slavery, oh, we're, we're going to go to slavery? Yes, your people will be in Egypt for 400 years. And then when that's over, the Amorite, these wicked people, when their time is full and they haven't responded, I'm going to send you guys in to take them out. Oh, there's a reason for this. I mean, is our nation just supposed to go in and kill people we don't like and say, well, the Bible says that's what the Jews did? Eh, that's a whole different thing. God had a purpose for that, and he was going to establish his kingdom in that promised land, which is still a promise he'll fulfill one day and he hasn't changed his mind. So the Jews had to know the word, and they had the word available to give them their identity and their purpose and then what to do. Christians are no different. As they say, we have an identity crisis today. How many young people are trying to find themselves? Well, go to the Bible, become a believer in Jesus, then go find yourself. He'll tell you exactly who you are and what you're to do. You'll get your identity and you'll have all your marching orders laid out right in front of you like somebody laying out clothing for your trip to work the next day. And your food's right there prepared, just to eat it. And they don't want to do that, so they waver in what they're doing here and what is the meaning of life, and I don't understand anything. The Bible tells us all we need to know. Does it tell us everything? Does God know a little more than what He revealed in the Bible? But what he's revealed is more than sufficient. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable to fully fit us out for every good work. We just got to get our nose in the book, right? 
So the order of the flow of Romans is significant. Uh, the way this is laid out and with the way the Holy Spirit guides Paul to write this material. So first we have the salutation. Paul writes the, to the believers at Rome to prepare them for his visit. So it's very personal. He's going to go meet them. That's his desire. So knowing that he's writing to children of God is helpful in the interpretation of his words throughout the epistle. For example, when he writes all the mandates of 12.1 to 15.13, is he writing to believers or unbelievers? Believers who are already saved. So is he given these mandates to show you this is how you get to heaven? This is what is required to get you to heaven? No. They're already saved, uh, 321 through 521, through faith in Christ. So 15, 12, 1 through 15, 13 are the mandates to walk healthy with God until you meet him face to face. So if you don't understand that, you'll say, well, this is part of the way you get to heaven. You've got to love one another. You've got to love God. You've got to respond to government properly. You have to accept your brother as God has accepted you and all that, or you'll go to the lake of fire. Well, no, this is a walk issue and how to walk healthy with God and how to walk godly as people who are already saved. So then you get to the section of sin, 118 through 320. Paul clearly defines the problem of all mankind. All are under sin and need a Savior. So um, I'll have you turn, let's see. Yeah, let's go to a few of these. Go to um, Romans 3. I think when you get to 2.1 through 3, eight, there are some extremely challenging verses there because it almost looks like Paul is saying you got to obey laws to be saved. <clears throat> but then when you get to the conclusion, you're like, okay, I messed up somewhere there because this is what he's really obviously saying. So in 3, nine, after he does all this, he says, what then? Are we better than they? Well, not at all, for we've already charged that both Jews and Greeks, which are Gentiles, are all under sin. Again, cuts you off at the knees, right? As the author said, it's a great leveler. <laughs> As it is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. And he's describing the unbeliever outside of Christ. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become useless. There's none who does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. By the way, these are all Old Testament quotes. With their tongues they keep deceiving, the poison of venomous snakes is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, the path of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now he's describing the unsaved outside of Christ, but do believers ever do any of this? Have you ever been bitter? No, you're a Christian now, You've never, you don't have the capacity for bitterness. Well, that's silly. How about their mouths are full of cursing? I mean, James is writing about the sins of the tongue, to, about two believers about this problem. And he says, with our tongues, we praise God and then we curse man the next day or in the same breath. And so we, we're duplicitous that way. We got that battle with the flesh. We'll serve God one moment and then we'll turn from him the next. But here I think he's describing the unbeliever. And then verse 19 now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. So nobody can be saved by keeping the law, for through the law comes the full knowledge of sin. It was very good at pointing out sin, that's not all the law did. As they say, when you look into the perfect mirror of God's Word, it reflects back a dirty face that, hey, I'm not perfect, and God is, and I fall short. And then you got, of course, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, which is put in the salvation section, which is actually 3.21 through 5.21. Again, phase one. Now, he's writing to converted people that are saved, but how did that happen? Clearly, it wasn't by works. He's, so he's reminding them of that. So the only solution to man's sin problem is the work of Christ on the cross, which for the person who believes in Christ will result in justification or imputed righteousness. 
the imputed righteousness of Christ. Again, salvation from the penalty of sin. So spiritually dead man has no righteousness before a perfectly righteous God, right? 310, there's no one righteous, not even one. So God sent his perfectly righteous son to bear the sins of unrighteous man on the cross. Did he die for all sin? Every one of them and for every man. I'd go to the jail and preach this and someone would come up and I always knew what was going to happen. He's going to tell me about some sin that he doesn't think was covered. I said, don't even tell me what it is because no matter how bad you think it is, it went to the cross. What do you not understand about all sin that he died for all men and for all sin? And, um, and I personally really don't want to hear it. You know? um, I've had confessed to me by Christians every sin that a man can commit. And so I'm not shocked by it. I'm not surprised. But I just go straight to the cross and say he died for all of those. And by the power of the Spirit, quit it. How's that? I didn't ever say, well, it's okay to keep doing it, you're saved. The Bible never does that. But it does stabilize you that this is who you are that cannot change in your position in Christ. So through faith alone and Christ alone, man will receive the imputed righteousness of God. If your Bible's open, look at three, Romans 3.28. I have these scriptures on the slide. I do get calls occasionally and said you... You read them, but I really want those references again, so I try to put them on slides so people can just go out to the web and get those because all these slides are out there for free. You can download them and take them and use them yourself. So Romans 3.28, for we maintain that a man is justified or declared righteous by faith apart from the works of the law. What could be more clear? Then go to 4 4 and 5. It's really 1 through 8, but I'm going to just go to two verses to show that it's through faith that we receive imputed righteousness. Romans 4, 4, and 5, now to the one who works, so this is the guy trying to work for salvation, his wage is not credited as a favor, but what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited or imputed to him as righteousness. So there's where we get imputed righteousness. The word credited is this Greek word logizomai. It can mean to ponder, to think intently, but it can also mean to credit to an account, and that's how it's used here. So you were an unsaved man, you believed in Christ, and you looked at your ledger immediately, and there's a plus R on it. God just credited perfect righteousness of Jesus to you. That's a gift, isn't it? It didn't cost you a thing. Most valuable thing ever. Romans 5.1, then he did, uh, says, therefore, to these believers, having been justified by faith, past tense, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what is your standing with God? You have a perfect righteous standing before Him, and now, where there was hostility and enmity, you now are at perfect peace with God. As Gene Brown used to say when he was here, he's gone to be with the Lord, but God put out a peace treaty and said, sign it, and when you believed in Christ, you're at peace now. With no more enmity in your position. Now, you can walk contrary to God, and he says, those will become my enemy in the walk, which is not a good thing. He makes war against the proud in the book of James 4, and then Peter says that. But in your position, you have perfect peace with God. You're reconciled through Jesus. He gets the glory. Notice, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then um, we'll go to sanctification. Verses 6 through 8, now remember the word sanctification is a, is a root, the verb hagiazo, to sanctify or set apart. Hagias is a, an a adjective, a, like a holy or holy one. And then you have hagiasmas and these other, there's nouns and um, holiness, hagiasune. And this root means to set apart, that's all it means. But in the spiritual life, when we believed in Christ, we're permanently set apart to God never changes. That's your position. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, um, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. But there's also a sanctification or a holiness in your walk, and that's also Scripture. Um, so we call this phase two, your walk. So the spiritual walk of the believer based on his position in Christ. So real briefly, chapter 6 teaches that at the moment of faith in Christ, all believers are positionally identified in his death burial, and resurrection. 
because Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, and rose on the third day. When you believe in him, you identify with him in that new position. When we get to Romans 6, 1 through 11, we'll deal with that extensively. So based on our new identity in Christ, we're to walk righteously according to God's word. Because when you get to 6, 12 through 23, it's a walk with God in holiness or sanctification. And then you get to 12, 1 through 15, 13, what does it look like? All those mandates. So the flow of the book is very helpful. And there's a lot about living in sanctification in this book. And then you get to chapter 7, the easiest chapter in the book, right? <laughs> it's got some, some difficulties. But there's one central thing Paul talks about is the struggle against the flesh that the believer, all believers will experience as he walks according to his position in Christ. When you get saved, you don't lose the flesh. Your old sinful nature hangs around, doesn't it? And at the resurrection, that will be gone. So in the meantime, you struggle. Like Rome, uh, Romans 7.20, Paul says, if I'm doing the very thing I don't want to do, because what he wants to do, he finds himself not doing it, then I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. You know, it's always somebody else's fault. I'm in a bad mood because of that guy. No, you have the flesh and you're letting it get to you. You're, you're sinful. You're grieving the Holy Spirit. You're letting your sinful nature take over. And you're not walking with God in the power of the Holy Spirit. So Paul describes, some people say he wasn't even a child of God then. I think he was, and I think he was a mature believer, describing the sin battle within. But then in Romans 8, he gives the, the best solution to it. What is Romans 8 about? What's the solution to this flesh struggle that we're all dealing with? Call your pastor. Hey, I'll help you. All I'm going to do is send you to the book and explain to you. If you're having trouble understanding what he means, fine, I'll help you all day long. But we got to get back in the Word. And what is the next chapter's solution? The Holy Spirit. Because Romans 8 is probably the best chapter in all the Bible on the Holy Spirit, the most comprehensive. So it's the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, that indwells all believers Romans uh, 8, 1 through 11, um, 1 Corinthians 6, uh, the end of that chapter says we're dwelt by the Spirit. So He'll empower us to walk righteously. So you've got to know Romans 8 well too. And then you get sovereignty. Chapters 9 through 11, God's promises to Israel as a nation will continue even in their apostasy. Remember, they killed Messiah. They killed their own Messiah. And they said to uh, Pilate at Jesus' trial, because he wanted to let him go, and he said, well, the Jews screamed, well, let Jesus' blood be on our own heads and on our children. Ooh, was that a stupid comment? Well, that's exactly what happened, because 40 years later, the Romans are going to be God's instrument, as he always used Gentile powers to punish his people, and they're going to come in and destroy Jerusalem. It was a terrible thing. So they're in a time of apostasy, but God's promises remain intact for the nation Israel. They have a future. So when you're watching the news and you're seeing all this stuff going on in the land of Israel, it all relates to God's plan for them. So Israel still has a future and God will fulfill all the promises to the nation that are clearly revealed in the Old Testament books. Dr. Sigor Olson, in his book, Beyond Calvinism and Arminianism, very interesting book from a man who was a staunch Calvinist, was a staunch Arminian, and now dropped both of them. And I agree with him why he did. Um, he found this middle ground. I, I'm not going to go down that road now. We'll wait till we get to Romans 9 through 11. <clears throat> I'd rather just stick to the text. If you read too many books on this, you're going to get so lost. If you stick to the text and let the theology come out, is better. But he says there is uh, a Jew-Gentile issue in the churches in Rome that surfaces all over the epistle. Probably the original core of, ch of the churches consisted of many Jews and proselytes converted on the day of Pentecost, augmented by converts from Paul's first two missionary journeys who migrated to Rome. However, when Claudius Caesar expelled the Jews from Rome, Acts 18-2, 8 the church naturally became totally Gentile. When the Jews drifted back into Rome under Nero, including Priscilla and Aquila, Romans 16.3, the Hebrew Christians were no longer running the church 
and may have felt like second-class members. They felt denigrated in the dispensational transition from Israel to the New Testament church. After all, weren't they God's chosen or choice people? And now they heard Paul was calling himself an apostle to the Gentiles, of all things. Paul, you've abandoned your own people Israel, they must have been complaining. But what about the two millenniums of promises made to Israel? Has the word of God been negated? Has God abandoned Israel? Well, Romans 9, 10, 11, those three chapters will show that God has not completely forsaken His covenant people and will be faithful to fulfill all He has promised to Israel. One, three of the hardest chapters together, I think, in the book, and uh, mainly because of the lack of Old Testament knowledge, but it's still challenging. And we'll, we'll get to that, I'm not going to say soon enough. No, I mean it in, in terms of God's timing, because soon can be a thousand years, right? So then you get to service as we start to close. 12.1 through 15.13, not that you can't pick up anything about service in other parts of the book, but this is the most concentrated part. These are all the mandates come in. It's not who are you, it's be who you are. So if a great focus here is on the mandates of the spiritual life. So the section begins a series of mandates. Over and over you'll find things, verbs in the imperative, on how to live the spiritual life as we relate to things like this, relate to God, to government and other believers in the body of Christ. It's much like the second half of Ephesians, all the mandates start coming in. <clears throat> I remember when I was in seminary, one of my profs said, as he was teaching us the basics of Romans, he says, you can see through the flow of the book that we often make a mistake, we take a brand new Christian, a new convert, and toss him into some particular area of service when he has no spiritual growth or capacity to handle it. Is that true? Yes, and I'm not saying that a new Christian can't serve God and, and actually apply, have the fruits of the Spirit in his life early on, but typically fruit is from a more mature Christian. So I'm not saying you got to go learn the Bible and then come back in five years and then you might be able to serve Him. I'm not saying that, and He's not either. He wasn't either in seminary. But we'll, we'll take a new Christian and dump him into this section or put him into some kind of service without any knowledge of who he is in Christ. And the Bible, Romans doesn't flow like that. It shows the priority of learning positional truth before service. For example, and I'll go out of Romans here, but when they give qualifications for elders in 1 Timothy 3, what was one of the qualifications? He cannot be a new convert. So you're going to take a brand new Christian and throw him into the elder role? Um, how about a five-year-old new Christian? Well, then you'd say he's just too young. He doesn't have any experience with people. And, I mean, we, we kind of get that in just secular life. But Paul says he must not be a new convert, 1 Timothy 3, 6. So that, why? So he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. In other words, a new convert may have a greater tendency to fall into the sin of pride. Now, does that mean a, a seasoned elder of 50 years can't get prideful? Of course not. But a new convert, it's very possible, and he just doesn't have the capacity yet. So there are restrictions, and there is an importance of spiritual growth. And you've got to look at the capacity of the one you're putting into service. Um, I remember when I was here in my first five years sometime, a guy walked in with a group, and he came up to me. The one guy of that group came up to me and said, Hey, I'm a youth leader. Can I start teaching your youth next week? What should I have said? No, I don't know you. I have no idea who you are. And, and we have rules here. We do background checks, all this stuff. But anyway, I said, I don't know you. And I got a youth leader anyway who's been doing this for a long time and doing a great job. But the fact that he would even would ask that question without without any hesitation, showed me something was wrong there. So I don't know what he's going to teach him. I don't know his theological background. Is he going to go walk in there and say you have to keep the Mosaic Law to be saved? I don't know. 
So I, I think it's not good to get to know somebody in particular areas of service and, and, and see if they have the capacity and are a good fit in your church. I just, wouldn't you agree that's just being a good shepherd to protect the sheep? Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying. We've got to protect the sheep. So, again, this doesn't mean that a Christian can't serve at all after salvation but and not exercise a spiritual gift. You know how many people still don't know what their spiritual gift is 20 years into the faith? You know what that tells me? You're not in the Word. You have not developed spiritually enough to know that God is revealing to you what your giftedness is. Um, so they take all these little quizzes that they gave us in the secular world to tell you your strengths in the business world. And, and most people lie because you, when you're going for a sales job, are you timid? Yes, I'm the most timid person in the world. You think you're going to put that down? You probably, if you are, you probably shouldn't take a sales job. So they're, they're, they're not good tools. And, and they've, a lot of people have proven they, uh, through, through setups that <laughs> this was not a good idea to use these tools. But as you grow spiritually, you will start seeing what your giftedness is. And another way I think it's possible to know, and don't bank on it 100%, somebody might walk up to you and tell you, this is your gift. I'm watching the way you function, and this is really your gift. And I, again, that's a man telling you, but I think it's a possibility. You ought to take that seriously if somebody does say it. But um, sometimes we jump too far, and somebody likes to read the Bible, and they say, you'd make a great pastor. Well, I don't know. Um, they may not be his calling. Like every time a little kid kicks a ball across the yard, oh, you're going to be playing for pro football. Well, no, you don't know that, but you know what I'm saying. So you've got to be careful, but if somebody, in the, in the, many in the congregation notice a way you're serving, that or it might be your giftedness. But the Bible will really develop that in you, and we know from 1 Corinthians 12 that it's the Holy Spirit that gives us our gifts. We don't pick them. It's not like going to the grocery store going, oh, I like, I like this one. Uh, no, the Holy Spirit will give you your gift or gifts, and then as you grow, you'll realize what He gave you, and it's to be used to serve the body. Now, we'll get to that when we get to the giftedness section in Romans 12. <clears throat> so as you grow in your knowledge of the Bible and your relationship with Christ, you'll be a more effective servant. Um, go to Romans 12. Examples of our obedient servanthood to the Lord and what that looks like extends through chapters 12 through 15. If this is in service, I don't know what is. Look at 12, 1 and 2. Paul says, I urge you then, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. Interesting, the priests would present sacrifices that were killed blood sacrifices on the altar, and now we're living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. So this is our walk, which is your spiritual service of worship. See, we have secular jobs to make money, and that's fine. You need a, you need a job. But what are, who are we really here for, and what are we really here to do ultimately? To serve the Lord. That is our ultimate job. And it's our service of worship. So to do this, we, have to, we can't be conformed to the world because he says, stop being conformed to this world. One, one man interpreted this as such, maybe an interpretive translation. Stop letting the world push you into its mold. Because doesn't it do that every day of the week? Everything we watch, and you can just watch regular news and it's pushing you into a mold. The only place you'll, it'll never happen is social media. Okay, I'm glad you laughed. I mean, people just look at the internet or social media and they believe everything they hear. After all, it's on the internet, right? Well, if you don't keep a Bible and have the Word of God in your heart every day to offset this, you're in trouble. And most people, if they go to church, sometimes once a week, once a month, twice a year, you think that much truth coming in is going to offset all that falsehood? Not enough. So don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That will be through the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word. 
so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Then you get to 12, 3 through 8. It focuses on humble unity within the body of Christ and then the different spiritual gifts God has given each of us to serve one another. So don't covet somebody else's gift. If God gave you one, flourish in that one. Doesn't 1 Corinthians um, tell us that there's many members in the body, but one head, that's Jesus? That's in chapter 12. But then some are hands, some are feet, arms, legs, eyeballs, all that. So one can't say to the other, I want that, or that one's not necessary. We're all, all important to God, even if you're a little toe, right? Well, I don't want to be a little toe. I want to be quarterback. That's how we grew up, and that's what we want in the church. We want to mandate what we are and what we, gifts God gave us. Go to the Lord and figure out what He gave you. Because if you try to serve outside your giftedness, it's going to be miserable. But you find where God wants you to serve, and you're going to love every bit of it. It'll be frustrating to try to do the other. So verses 10 through 21 of the same chapter focuses on the importance of genuinely loving one another, unity within the body of believers, as, and as he says specifically, clinging to what is right rather than doing evil. There's that Romans 7 issue. Why would he tell us not to do evil if it wasn't still capacity to do so? He, the Lord knows it is, so you've got to walk in the spiritual life to have victory in that struggle of Romans 7. So then chapter 13, 1 through 7 reveals our responsibilities before human government. We may not like them, but they're there because government's ordained of God. Then Romans 13, 8 through 14, a great section here, reveals the importance of love. And by doing so is the fulfillment of God's law and keeps us prepared for our final salvation or deliverance at Christ's coming. Yeah, you heard me, a final salvation. If you're already saved, how can we be saved later? Because salvation has different aspects. Uh, let me read you Romans 13. Are you in Romans 13? Look at verse 11. Do this knowing the time... That is, it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. This doesn't mean don't sleep in church. Well, yeah, it does. <laughs> Somebody, uh, one of the elders told me the other day there, um, and he said it to the group, I think, on Tuesday, but no, 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 it was, a, it was at an elder, whatever, it doesn't matter. It was at an elders meeting, but... He said, you know, in those big churches, they always pan to the audience, and everyone's going, they got taken notes. He said, when they accidentally panned to one section, there were like three guys going, <laughs> I mean, just snoring, you know. Ooh, get the camera off of him. So I watch you. Hey, if you got to catch some Z's because you didn't sleep last night, I'll let you do it. Just don't snore. I'm going to stop you, okay? <laughs> but he says, do this knowing the time that it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. So in other words, be spiritually alert and obey the Lord. Why, for now, salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Wait a minute. We're already saved, and that's permanent. Once saved, always saved. So what does he mean? Well, there's an aspect of uh, soteria, the Greek word for salvation, that means deliverance. So we're going to be delivered when Christ comes back from all of this mess we're dealing with in the devil's world, including our own flesh. That'll be one of the best things to be delivered from is yourself, right? <laughs> you get a resurrection body, no more capacity to sin. That's going to be awesome. So there is a final deliverance coming, and I can defend this all day from the Old Testament. There's a lot of places, Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, Isaiah 56, 1, on and on, where there's a deliverance or a salvation that's to come. Hebrews says a salvation ready to be revealed in the, last, in the last time. So that's when Jesus returns. So the Jews thought in terms of that deliverance all through the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. So one day, we're after being saved from the penalty of sin, we're going to enjoy a final deliverance. So in the meantime, keep alert. Stay salty, as they say. Walk in the spiritual life 
and be uh, ready to always be obeying the Lord because He could come back at any time. So then you get to chapter 14, which is devoted to loving our brother. Now, this chapter is centrally focused on a mature believer being sensitive to what he calls the one weak in faith. The, we, the one weak in faith is a new Christian that doesn't understand his liberty or freedom in Christ based on the things he can now do that he may have scruples against. So what were they? It was consumption, what you eat or drink, wine and food. And then he talks about the days you worship or the, the days you call sacred. Some see all days alike, some put one day as sacred. But for the weaker brother, you've got to be careful with him. For example, um, some people have scruples about what they can eat spiritually. They say, I can't eat that because that violates God. Is there anything that violates God that we can, cannot eat? And the law of Israel, was there anything? Absolutely. There's a whole chapter devoted to food laws, Leviticus 11. You cannot eat that. You can eat this. You can eat fish, but it, it has to have scales. So you can't eat shark, right? You can't eat predators like lions or eagles, hawks. But you can eat bird, right? You can eat chicken, stuff like that. So they had food laws. You couldn't eat bottom feeders like crab or, or lobster because they eat dead things, and that was symbolic. But then when Peter has the tablecloth vision in Acts 10, God says, get up and kill and eat. And they're all unclean foods in that vision. He goes, I've never eaten anything unclean. You're not under the law anymore. You can do that. Mark 7, Jesus declared all foods clean because the dispensation is now shifting. And so there are people that have a, a, a sensitivity to eating certain foods, but we got to be careful with that because if we offend their conscience, God says it's sin to you. However, here's my view on this. you got to get the weak brother strong, so you got to teach him. You can't just leave that alone or he'll never grow. But you've got to be very delicate with it when you say, well, the Bible says we can eat this, and he may say, where? Then gently show him and let the Spirit work in his life. But um, uh, I always say this as the example. If somebody has a problem eating and they think as a Christian they can't eat the, the foods of Leviticus 11 that the law forbid for the Jewish people under the law, which we're not, um, <clears throat> then invite them over to your house and serve ham. You don't do that, okay? Um, uh, th that's putting him to the test. That's going to make him stumble, and God's going to say, that was a sin because your heart was wicked. You knew exactly what you were doing. Now, if you had a, a, a festival at your house and had those foods on the table, and he barges into your party uninvited, well, he can gripe all of that he wants to about the ham, but we can eat that. You see, see what I'm saying? You don't want to blow smoke in their face to try to offend them. And some Christians get that way. Well, I'll show him. Well, you better show him kindly with love so that he can grow and come out of that. Yeah, I bumped into that all the time in the jail. There's guys that were reading the Bible. They're saying, as Christians, we can't eat any of this. And, and so I'd say, I disagree. If you want to let me show you, I will. And I'd show them. And they're like, boy, that was a leap for them. They're like, I can't do this. Well, look at Peter. I've never eaten anything unclean. All those years of Jewish... Uh, history of living under the law, now all of a sudden he can do that? That's not easy for some people. So we got to be sensitive to that. Um, I never had that background. We had bacon and eggs all the time. Uh, and it wasn't a spiritual thing. We had no idea. But as I got into the Bible, I saw this. And um, So we have to be very careful as a mature believer how we handle the weaker brother. Why does he say? He says, because we'll all stand before the judgment seat of God. Romans 14.10, if you're there. But you, why do you judge your brother? Now, that doesn't mean you cannot evaluate your brother. You just can't do it self-righteously or without love. That's what Jesus was saying in Matthew 7, 1 through 6, with do not judge. You can judge, but he says, first get the log out of your eye, then you can see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. Oh, so I can judge, yes, but not with a log in your eye. In other words, you can't be self-righteous. But if you clear that out, then you can rightly help your brother. Everyone's walking around saying, don't judge, don't judge me. And little kids, are you going to say that to your parents? You told me I can't do that. Don't judge me. It's not what it's saying. So we got to be careful if, that we don't want to judge our brother in a self-righteous manner or an incorrect manner. So why do you judge your brother? Or again, why do you regard your brother with, see, it's with contempt? We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. 
Oh, every day that gets closer, doesn't it? And sometimes we forget. It's not, for Christians, it's not to determine whether we get into heaven or not, but we're going to be evaluated for our service, to, I think, to determine rewards. Uh, well, we better start closing up. Chapter 15, the mandates of our service extend all the way through 1513. So real short, Christians are to edify, encourage, and build one another up through the written instruction and the word. You cannot serve your fellow brother if you don't know the word yourself. It's, it will benefit you personally, but it will benefit anyone who needs your help. The more you know about the Bible, you want to get to the point where you don't even have, a, have to have a Bible in your hand, and somebody comes up to you for help, and you can just take them to where uh, they need to go uh, spiritually, and as far as the Scripture to find things for their issue. But we're also, as it says in 15.7, to accept one another as God has accepted us, past tense. So we presently accept each other in the body as God has already accepted us in Christ. And so all, all your warts and all, right? He saved you on the spot at your worst. And you're going to turn around and not accept another because they're sinful? Now, there is a place, obviously, to draw the line. There is church discipline. I get it. Um, but you see, we're all one in Christ, and so we need to recognize that. Every one of you in this room, am I more righteous than you? Y'all said no too quickly. In our position, who's the most righteous in the room? We're all equally have the same imputed righteousness of Christ. He didn't say, well, I'm going to give a little to this guy and a lot to him. The standing is the standing. We all have it, so every one of you has the same standing I do. So I sure love the way God's grace is manifested in my life. Why wouldn't I want to be that way with you? Boy, we've been forgiven much, but we forgive little. Isn't there a parable on that? that we just read in Tuesday morning, Matthew 18, the guy that was forgiven this insurmountable debt by his master, he turns around and won't forgive another fellow slave 50 bucks. Of course, the, the master hears about that. I forgave you all this debt, and you wouldn't forgive that man anything? That's us sometimes. So the section closes in Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we get to the last one, summation. As we summarize this message. So in 15, 14 through 29, Paul discusses his role as an apostle to the Gentiles. And then in 1530 through 33, Paul asks for prayer in relation to the Jewish people. In 1530, he says, I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints." that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. Now may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. And then chapter 16 shows a very personal side to the letter. As Paul writes greetings to various believers in Christ, and notice he calls them all by name. Greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so. So he knew these people specifically by name and uses their names. Very personal. And then the epistle closes. 16, 24 through 27, the, the God of grace, or excuse me, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has uh, been made known to all the nations leading to the obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. I think that's a good place to stop. That's a great, a great prayer that Paul has.
So let's, let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for this introduction. Just to kind of breeze through the, the basics of the flow of this book to see where we're headed and how important it is for, to know our position. And we thank you for that position because we went from no one in this room being righteous to at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone, being made perfectly righteous through the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Oh, Lord, we thank you for that perfect standing in your son. You see us as you see your son, perfect righteousness in our standing. We thank you for that. That could only be accomplished through the power of God and the cross of Jesus Christ, the very Christ who died on that cross for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead. And if anyone is here who's never believed in Christ, may he make that choice today to put his faith alone in Christ alone, to receive that imputation of God's righteousness, and therefore be qualified to walk with you in obedience and by the power of the Spirit to be your representatives as we all anticipate that salvation that was nearer than when we first believed. And we'll ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.